Welcome to Life Study of the Bible with Witness Lee, a program provided by Living Stream Ministry and featuring the ministry of Watchman Nee and Witness Lee. These two were faithful slaves of the Lord during their entire Christian lives and have become patterns to us of ones that counted all things lost on account of Christ. Witness Lee completed his most comprehensive work called the Life Study of the Bible just before going to be with the Lord in 1997. This program combines short excerpts from his original speaking, along with some of our own comments and fellowship. And as always, we'd like to hear from you with your thoughts or answer any questions that might arise while you're listening. We'll repeat this contact information at the end of the program, but if you have a pen right now, jot down our toll-free number, which is 888-LIFE-STUDY, 888-543-3788. Or you can reach us by email to radio at lsm.org. Now, let's join today's program. In reading the Old Testament, it's easy to become lost at times in page after page of history because much of the Old Testament is devoted to telling this history, the history of God's people, Israel, in both their triumphs and their many failures. To study it in this way does have some value. But if that is the extent of our realization of the Old Testament we will miss a lot. In fact, we will miss the Lord's burden for us in that portion of Scripture, for both the Lord Jesus himself in his direct speaking concerning the Old Testament and the Apostle Paul in example after example of how he applied the Old Testament made it clear that in reality, the Old Testament is a book of types and symbols that if properly understood, reveal Christ to us in marvelously clear pictures that can often convey more of the spiritual reality than even the direct and condensed passages of the New Testament. One of the great types of Christ in the books of history surely is the prophet Elisha, who typified Christ in his living, his ministry, and as we'll see today, even in his death. Matt Miller has joined us uh, on rare occasions. Matt, you and I get to share the studio together, uh, one being the host, one being the guest, and so you want to be the guest today or the host? (laughs) <laughs> I'll be the guest, Chris. I'm glad to be a, a guest with you and let you host the program. Thanks for inviting me in. Man, I appreciate the many times when you fill in here when I'm away or unable to, uh, uh, you know, to take care of the program and you do a great job. And I've also enjoyed the times we've had to share uh, when we've been able to both participate in the program. And uh, we have that opportunity today in an interesting passage in the book of Second Kings, isn't it? It is. And I'm glad you invited me for this one. It's particularly Enjoyable to me because it, uh, well, I think we'll get into it more, but it's a very particular uh, story with Elisha, and I yeah. hope our listeners will stay with us. I think they'll all enjoy this in a very practical way for their own personal life. As uh, is usually our, our way, occasionally we vary, but normally we have three sections to the program. We will uh, today as well. The first one will be this uh, story that I alluded to in the introduction, and that is Elisha uh, had a glorious death. And we've seen in a number of the programs now in Kings, how in his life, in his ministry, he was a clear type of the Lord Jesus. But there's a particularly poignant passage related to Elisha in his death that also connects him to Christ in the New Testament, doesn't it? Yeah, it's it's Second Kings chapter 13, verses 20 and 21. And those verses are very uh, striking. It talks about the children of Israel were burying a man who had died, and then the raiders were coming. And so, They threw this dead man into Elisha's grave, and the dead man immediately became alive. Right. He touched the body of Elisha, right? He touched the body of Elisha in Elisha's grave, and there was so much life-giving power in the bones of Elisha that it even brought this dead man back to life. Now, of course, that picture in itself is not that meaningful unless you apply it to Christ in his death which means Christ in his resurrection, because Christ didn't stay dead in his death. He rose after three days. So when we touch Christ as the resurrected one today, it turns our deadness into life. Every believer was a dead person before they believed into Christ. I know this is my story. When I first touched Christ, I was dead before Mm -hmm. that. I was Mm -hmm. just like this dead man in Kings who became alive. And it's not just a once-for-all experience. 
but we continually touch Christ on a daily basis, and it turns our death into life. Us people who can become dead through our contact with the world and the worldly things are made alive through our contact with the resurrected Christ. I'm glad you put it that way, uh, as we just take a minute here before we join Winnis Lee. I have to confess today, I'm a perfect candidate for this kind of experience. I've had a harried day, spent over half the day sitting in a doctor's office. We all know what that's like. And then right. fighting the L.A. freeway traffic to get here so that we could record this program. And as you and I were praying before we open up the microphones, I had that distinct sensation that I was just like this one that had been uh, tossed unceremoniously into the tomb, but uh, behind the scenes, there was an intervention because this happened to be the tomb that contains the body in resurrection of the living Christ, and any contact with him really enlivens us even today, doesn't it? It does, and that's why I'm so happy that I could be here for this program because I also experienced that, uh, not so much today in my recent memory, but more recently, last week, I had the experience of inwardly dead yeah. and going to the touching the Lord in his resurrection. I mean, the Lord's available to touch. And as I touched him, I really experienced an enlivening and, and bringing into the power of his resurrection. Well, uh, in the Lord's mercy, Matt, we just pray together that this program would be such an enlivening uh, encounter and touch with the resurrected Christ. Well, you know, a lot of people are looking for miracles, Chris. I think this D.L. Moody said the greatest miracle is the miracle of regeneration. And we're going to hear Witness Lee quote that same passage by D.L. Moody in the portion just ahead. Let's join him now. The glorious ending of Elias' life and his ministry. Very interesting. You may read the story. Elisha, he died, and his body was buried in a tomb. Then one day, there was some kind of fighting. A man got killed, and they cast that man's body into the tomb of Elisha. And that body touched Elisha's body, and that man got Eleven. <laughs> the dead Eliza killed eleven people. What is this? What is this? This is Christ. Amen. In resurrection. Don't touch him. Whosoever touched him, even that person got eleven. I would say probably this is the top miracle. Among all the miracles in the Bible. Do you think so? I still remember the Almudi once. He said, the greatest miracle is regeneration. And what is regeneration? Regeneration is the dead people touching the died and resurrected Christ. Whosoever touches Christ... And this man will be eleven by Christ. So Elisha was a wonderful type of Christ. Have you noticed there is such a story? It was a miracle. With what notion? The notion is even Jesus was crucified and put into the tomb. Even such a one, when you, as a dead person, touched him, you got eleven. Whether this is a miracle or not, I didn't know. But I do know, 67 years ago, I touched him. I got alive. I become altogether another person. Well, Matt, before uh, we joined Witness Lee, we got to talk about the story a little bit. So I'd like to focus in on a couple of the intrinsic points. Good. You know, uh, it struck me listening again here. Uh, Often when we talk about the gospel, or when we sing in our hymns about uh, the gospel message, redemption gets the main focus. And certainly there is a great miracle associated with the Lord's accomplishment of our redemption on the cross, that he could be made sin for us so that we could be saved and justified in him is certainly a great miracle. But let's come back to this point, this quote that you said, and and Witness Lee made the same uh, uh, quote, quoting D.L. Moody, that regeneration is the greatest miracle Talk about regeneration and why that would qualify as a miracle of such a category. To say that redemption is a great miracle is 100% true. It is a great miracle. Right. But there's much more to salvation than just redemption. And the greatest part of salvation is not just that we're redeemed from our sins, not that the Lord would cleanse us from our sins, but that he would give us his life. Yeah. 
You know, Colossians 1.27 says, Christ in you is the hope of glory. Romans 5.10 says that much more you will be saved in his life. There's a, an enlivening aspect to salvation that is involved with us receiving the Lord's life. And I can't help, Chris, but go back and read a hymn that Witness Lee wrote. I hope that's okay. Oh, that's great. And in this particular message, it, it's not part of the radio program today. But when you go back and listen to the entire speaking of Witness Lee on this particular life study, he was very burdened about this hymn, number 539 in the hymns put out by Living Stream, Mm -hmm. that is talking about this matter of how available the Lord is to us today as the Spirit to give us life. Let me read a few of the verses to the song. Yeah, good. It starts out and it says, O Lord, thou art in me as life and everything to me. Subjective and available, thus I experience thee. We can experience the Lord as life. He's in us as life today. Colossians 3, 4 says that Christ is our life. How many Christians are talking about that? That's why we need to have this radio program. Somebody asked me one time, why do you have this radio program? There's so many Christian programs. Well, the reason we need to have a radio (laughs) program like this is for this very point. It's called a life study. We study Christ as life in us for our experience to live on earth today by his resurrection power, not by our natural life. And and then the the chorus to the song says, O Lord, thou art the spirit, how dear and near to me, how I admire thy marvelous availability. Wow. The Lord's available for us to live by him today as the spirit in our spirit. You know, uh, I'm familiar with this hymn as well, Matt, and uh, when Witness Lee wrote it, uh, and as you said, as it is uh, published in our hymn book, that last line is how I admire your marvelous availability. But uh, oftentimes, I don't know about you, but when we sing it in our uh, congregation, we usually substitute the word enjoy for admire. We just take a little liberty there. How I enjoy your marvelous availability. We want to admire Christ as life, but we really want to enjoy him as, as life, don't we? I think admiring is part of enjoying. It surely it's hard is. hard to enjoy if you don't admire. Well, I think what what we've got have today is sort of a, a program in reverse order from how we usually do it because here we began with the example and the example is seeing a type in the old testament and how in god's economy it is applied in a very new testament experiential context this matter of elisha laying there in the tomb in death but yet the dead man whose body rolled over and touched elisha is enlivened really being a type of Christ in resurrection in our experience. The next couple of sections in the broadcast today are going to talk about this principle of seeing the Old Testament types and how important it is to have this kind of view when we come to the Old Testament. And Witness Lee will point out, even from the pages of the Old Testament, and I'm going to read two verses from Isaiah that I think make it very clear. This really is the intrinsic function of the Old Testament. In Isaiah 7, of course, Isaiah and the other prophets, they were they were concurrent with the history that we're reading about in kings. On the one hand, we have the history and what happened to this king and that king, but alongside these kings were these prophets who were really raised up in the principle of overcomers, weren't they, Matt, to maintain God's testimony? Absolutely. Okay, so at this time, Isaiah then writes in chapter 7, verse 14 of his prophecy, therefore, The Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. And in 9.6, a verse that uh, I think we tend to stress but gets understressed generally in Christian ministry, a marvelous verse. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. These are great verses, aren't they? Absolutely. All right, let's go back to Witness Lee. I'd like to fellowship with you concerning the uh, relationship of the uh, typology in the Old Testament history and the fulfillment of God's economy in the New Testament. What was there in the Old Testament history was a in typology. Since it was a type in typology, surely it needs the fulfillment. And the fulfillment is in New Testament. Now, 
we have to see how this typology was fulfilled. In one way, was fulfilled. You know, the prophets' books, Isaiah 1, Daniel, Zechariah, Jeremiah, and so forth, all these prophets' books are books going along with the history of Israel. In Isaiah's book, while he was helping the kings, he prophesied that one day the very God of Israel will be a child born of a virgin, yet his name is called God. God with us. That's God. Who was that child in a manger? That was God. Then the second verse in Isaiah 9, 6. It says, listen, a sign is given. Who is this sign? This is that child is given. And his name is called the Almighty God. Yeah. And the Eternal Father. Marvelous. What is this, dear saints? This is God becoming man. For what purpose? For the purpose to accomplish his economy. And then by what way to accomplish the economy? By his becoming a man through quite a process, through incarnation, through human living, through crucifixion, the all-inclusive, one for death, to enter into resurrection. Then, in resurrection, he, as the last Adam in the flesh, became a life giving spirit. Chris, I'm going to grab the mic from you and take host role right now. And I'd like to uh, actually ask you to uh, respond to what we just heard from Witness Lee there. Well, I'll just give a short response, but it invites you also to jump in, Matt. You know, these two passages, as an example that he quoted or referred to, and we read a moment ago, Isaiah 7 and Isaiah 9, in, undisputably, these are clear references to the coming of, of Christ. You know, his birth, the incarnation is there. But as you look a little deeper beyond just the surface, it's not just a, a reference or a prophecy of the coming of Christ, but we really see a prophecy of the process that which the triune God is going to pass through to accomplish everything in his economy. And this is where I certainly could use some help and would ask for some, Matt. We use this word process frequently. Uh, Sometimes we're criticized for it. On one hand, of course, God is unchanging. He's eternal in his essence. And we not only do we not deny that, we affirm it and celebrate it. But in his work, in the carrying out of his eternal plan and purpose, there is a a clear reference in so many passages, both Old and New Testament, to this matter of a process. Why don't you pick it up here and and describe a little bit about what we mean uh, when we use this term process and how we see it even in these verses. Well, there's two aspects to the Trinity, and one aspect is, is the essential aspect where all three of the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Spirit, are eternally distinct and eternally unchanging. Right. And the other aspect is God's economy or the economical aspect of the Trinity. And in that aspect of the Trinity, it says in John chapter one, that the word was with God and the word was God. And then the word became flesh. Right. So if becoming something is not part of a process, then I don't know what that means. So in God's economy to reach man for salvation, he became a man. And then after his death in 1 Corinthians 15, 45, it says the last Adam, who is this man, became a life-giving spirit. So the two becomings of Christ are the strongest argument. Yeah. It's very convincing to me. And I don't, right. I don't see how anyone could argue with this matter of process. The Lord went through a process to save us. You know, I'm two perfect examples. I'm going to give these references to our listeners and invite them to write these two verses down. Uh, go back after the program and take your Bible and look for yourself because, again, there are two becomings of Christ. Number one is John chapter 1, verse 14. 
uh, as you said, the word became flesh and dwelt or tabernacled among us. A clear reference to the incarnation there. Then in 1 Corinthians 15, 45, the second part of the verse, the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. In the context of 1 Corinthians 15, that last Adam must be, has to be the Lord Jesus, doesn't it? No question about it. All right, Matt, our time is short. Let's get on with our third section. We're going to kind of stay in this uh, vein that we've uh, struck in this last fellowship. Here's Witness Lee once more. This one is very wonderful. Firstly, he was God becoming a human son in incarnation. And he lived as such a one. He was God, but now he's no more just God. He's God. He also became man. He's the God-man. Paul called him the last item. That means the conclusion of mankind. As the conclusion of mankind, the last item. In the flesh, he became a life-giving spirit. Who is he? God. Who is he? God becoming a man. Who is he? He is a God-man. Who is he? He is the last Adam in the flesh. Then eventually, who is he? He is the life-giving spirit. Amen. Is this a small thing? No. It is this life-giving spirit who regenerated us, who is God within us, not only dwelling in us, living in us, but also is building himself into our being to form for himself a home within us. In other words, to make us to his constitutional building, his home. Matt, I think in principle we touched the point he just made, but I I think you may have a good uh, closing thought for us on this really wonderful program today. I do, Chris, and and I agree with you. It is a very wonderful program. First of all, I'd like to quote a verse. That's Ephesians 3.17. It's the Apostle Paul's prayer. Yeah, He's on his knees Mm -hmm. praying that Christ would make his home in our hearts through faith. So it's critical to see that when Witness Lee talks about God wanting to build his home into us, This is the Apostle Paul's prayer. Christ would make his home in our heart. And another verse is 1 Corinthians 6, 17 that talks about he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit. And then I'd like to read the last verse of the hymn we talked about earlier, which is verse 5. It says, O thou art ever one with me, unrivaled unity, one spirit with me all the time for all eternity. Wow. You know, the Lord wants to bring us into this kind of a oneness with him. He really does. And he has. We just need to enter into it and experience it more and more. And that's what the burden of this radio program is for. As you said earlier in the broadcast, Matt, we, uh, not by accident or just because we thought it had a catchy sound to it, there's a very definite purpose to the name of this program being the Life Study. Because right. this ministry, and in a very real sense, is very tunnel vision. Uh, it doesn't pretend to be a broad kind of Bible study touching all of the things that are typically incorporated in an expansive Bible study. It's lasered onto this uh, this realization and even revelation on every page of Scripture of Christ as life, isn't it? We want every listener, after they hear this program, to know the Lord more as a person, to love the Lord more, and to have more experience of oneness with the Lord as the Spirit in their daily life. Yeah, maybe uh, in the Lord's arrangement, we'll get a chance to have this kind of fellowship again uh, soon. I look forward to it because I always enjoy it. Me too. I hope so, Chris. Well, we hope you've uh, enjoyed the program, and we hope if you found yourselves like uh, uh, I admitted to being today, and Matt said he was last week and needed to roll over in the tomb we were in and touch the resurrected one, we hope this program ministered to you in that kind of way. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Our toll-free number, one eight 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 life study 888-543-3788. For Matt Miller, I'm Chris Wilde. Thanks very much for listening today.
Thank you for listening to Life Study of the Bible with Witness Lee, brought to you by Living Stream Ministry. Witness Lee spent seven decades in the 20th century speaking Christ, first in Asia and then North America, eventually all over the world. The culmination of those 70 years of ministry was his Life Study of the Bible, an exhaustive exposition of the entire scriptures. This unique commentary focuses on how Christ can be life to man in an experiential and practical way. These programs encapsulate Witness Lee speaking in just 26 minutes. But to get the complete riches, visit lifestudy.com. From there, you can read all of the Life Study messages in their entirety or download any of our more than 1,700 audio programs at no cost. Again, that website is lifestudy.com. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this video, please like, share, and subscribe. Follow us on social media or visit our website for more from Living Stream Ministries.